I'd like to begin by saying uh, welcome to all of our attendees who are here this evening. Um, we're excited and fortunate to have a wonderful panel um, featuring Tomo Bysted, uh, the Senior Director of Product Creation for TaylorMade. Um, as many of you know, a leading manufacturer of uh, high performance golf equipment. Josh Belkoff, the Vice President of Business Development for Sports Business Solutions, a firm that offers sales, training, consulting, and recruiting services for a multitude of professional sports teams. Uh, JJ um, Banash, who serves as the Global Director of, marketing, uh, of Digital Marketing for Nixon, um, a premium watch and accessory brand for the youth lifestyle market. And last but not least, Melissa Browser, who is the Digital uh, Marketing Strategist for Prana, a premium and sustainable lifestyle clothing brand for yoga, travel, and outdoor enthusiasts. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to begin the panel by uh, asking each of our guests uh, to go through and briefly describe your role and what influenced your decision to pursue a career in sports uh, slash lifestyle industry. Um, kind of weird with all the panelists not being at podiums, but they're all pinned up here. So I'm going to start with Tomo to my right. Hi there. So um, Tomo, if you could just uh, briefly describe um, your role with TaylorMade and kind of what influenced your decision to pursue um, a career um, in the sports industry. That'd be great. Of course. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. And thanks everyone for inviting me for this panel. It's, uh, it's exciting to talk to everyone and, and glad you, got, you could all join us for this. Um, definitely happy to talk about my, my career so far. I, I've been in the golf industry now for 15 years. Um, and sort of my role currently is uh, I'm heading up product creation, really mainly for the metal woods. So you know, if you're a golfer and you've um, been in a golf store recently and, and you bought a driver or a fairy wood or a hybrid, that's uh, products that, that I've worked on. And uh, that's, you know, fantastic job that I, I love to do. I love golf and I, I love the, the, the whole idea of creating product and, and bringing uh, stories to life with consumers and, and um, at retail. So that's really fun. And I've been doing this now for, for about seven years in terms of the product creation piece of it. I worked in other categories before. Um, and like I said, I've been with TaylorMade for 15 years. And prior to that, I was actually working overseas. So uh, in that capacity, I had sort of a different role. I was more in charge of marketing uh, for different regions. So I actually started in Australia back in 2006, um, worked there for a couple of years. And then I was in charge of Asia for marketing, um, working out of Hong Kong um, between about 2008 and uh, 2013. So uh, pretty global back, background to that. Bef before that, I was not um, really in the golf industry. I worked a couple of years with Titleist, but before that, I was in finance. And so for me, it was really a, a, a passion thing for me to come to golf uh, and work in the golf industry and in the sports um, sector. And I think for me, 100% um, feel like that was the right move. Um, it's, been, it's been fun to, to work in golf, and I continue to, to, to want to strive to do more. Honestly, that's, that's kind of my passion right now. That's awesome. Um, if I could direct the same question now toward Melissa um, about uh, briefly describing your role and what influenced the decision. Yeah, to join absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melissa Brower, and currently I'm a digital marketing strategist at Prana. For those of you that don't know what Prana is, it's a clothing lifestyle brand, brand with the main focus on sustainability. Um, a lot of our clothing is also fair trade certified. Um, so I was really interested in the brand. I had kept my eye on it for a couple of years. It's based in North County in Carlsbad. Um, so this role became available. I've been in it for about a year and a half, um, and I lead up our digital marketing strategy. So currently um, the channels that I oversee is the affiliate marketing channel, our SEO. I own the creative asset process for digital marketing. So working with our designers, I run our Facebook paid strategy campaigns for both prospecting and retargeting our display retargeting program. And then I also sit as the lead for our seasonal marketing campaigns. We have two launches every year, the fall and the spring campaign. So I sit on a group uh, cross-functionally across marketing, wholesale, retail, and I bring those ideas to life um, for the product and the product stories that the designers want us to tell to the digital marketing space. 
Prior to that, I actually was at Taylor Made Golf, uh, where Tom was at, for four years. And there I was an associate manager of digital marketing. Um, when I first came on to the brand, um, I was on the e-commerce team for digital. I was the second person they brought on. Um, and to be honest, I was working in New York City and I was working more in the international education nonprofit space. And I was looking to move over to corporate and business just purely a career change. Um, and Taylor May caught my eye. Uh, one of my friends from UCSD, I graduated in 2010, was working there. And so she brought me onto the team, uh, quickly fell in love with Taylor May, the culture, the people, um, stayed there for a really long time just because I, I really enjoyed the company. Um, some of the overlap between Prana and Taylor Made with my role includes um, being on the e-commerce team, owning the budget for the channels, um, managing the KPIs, like driving traffic, retention, acquisition, conversion, and both of them are premium brands. So that also creates some unique opportunities and some challenges uh, with how I, I've worked through uh, those brands. Thank you, Melissa. Um, <laughs> now, if I could go pass it on to JJ. Yeah, so uh, JJ Banish, and uh, as you guys mentioned earlier, Global Director of Digital Marketing uh, for Nixon. Uh, I'm still relatively, I consider myself relatively new to Nixon. I joined uh, back in March, right before the pandemic started. So I was in the office for, for about two weeks and then remote ever since. And so a lot of my coworkers I have yet to meet in person. I've seen a lot of Zoom meetings with them, but that's a whole different story. Um, I took a, a slightly different path uh, to, to get to Nixon. Um, I spent the last almost 20 years being on the digital agency side in different capacities. So as I was going to college, I was interning at, a, at an agency and kind of helped them get into the digital world as a traditional agency. And then I've moved all the way up to starting my own agencies that uh, I sold off uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago now. And after I went through that path of working with hundreds of clients um, in different, different ways of acquisition, retention, customer retention, um, website development, all sorts of things that you do on the digital side of things, um, I decided that brand direct was was where I wanted to be and uh, to be able to focus and, and point all my my attention towards one brand so we can get uh, get in a good spot and uh, growing up in North County and in San Diego, having Nixon in my backyard was kind of always on my radar of a cool company and culturally I kind of grew up in, in the action sports world, uh, always had friends that were surfers skaters uh, that, that had Nixon or were sponsored by Nixon in the past. Um, so it's kind of a good marriage between uh, where I came from and what Nixon wanted to do moving forward. So um, my day-to-day -day role is to bring all digital marketing in-house and build an in-house team. Um, they were using a lot of external agencies and uh, now, now we have 100% of what we do on digital marketing in-house with a, a team of people that are underneath me. So um, kind of bringing the agency world into Nixon uh, is, is what I've been doing over the last year. Great, thanks, JJ. And then um, finally, Josh, if you would touch on. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, thanks, Zach. And uh, and first off, thank you, uh, UCSD and everyone uh, for being on the panel and for having us, uh, for having myself. Um, name's Josh Belkoff. I, uh, um, I've been with SBS, with Sports Business Solutions, uh, for the past little over three years at this point. Uh, our, I'm our VP of Business Development. And what we do is we are a training and consulting company within the professional sports and major minor league sports business industry, um, where we focus in on a lot of sales development, uh, sales coaching and training, uh, sponsorship and marketing uh, consulting, where we work with, uh, with about 160 partners across the United States and Canada uh, and focus in on, 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 their, on their sales development teams. Um, from all different leagues, NBA, NHL, MLB, MLS, NFL, uh, WNBA, NASCAR. Uh, we, we have a ton of clients that we work with specifically um, on the development end. Uh, and we also have a piece of our, of our business uh, as, from a platform standpoint, where we work with a lot of aspiring professionals to really network and connect with people that are currently in the industry um, and, and really help be a GPS to help direct the students or pro, um, aspiring professionals within how, where they want to go within the, the sports business world and sector. Uh, so I'm, I'm a salesperson. Uh, I'm, I'm on revenue generation side of the business. Uh, 
been with SBS for a little over three years. And prior to that, I spent about five and a half years with the Phoenix Suns organization and a few different sales and development roles there, uh, oversaw our entry level sales team and then our premium sales and hospitality group um, from 2012 and 2000 to 2017. Uh, and, and really what we, what we enjoy doing is really helping people succeed within the sports business landscape uh, and really grow uh, their careers. So I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess a, a question, um, Josh, uh, directed back at you would be, um, how did you land your current role? And uh, what was the interview process like as breaking into any industry, especially in the sports industry? Um, the interview is the one of the hardest parts. Yeah, it's a really good question, Zach. Uh, so I'll, I'll back it up to my first role in sports with, was with the Suns organization and actually the owner of the of the uh, business that I'm with now, his name's Bob Hamer, uh, and he started SBS in the clubhouse back in 2014. But when I was at school in 2012, I was, you know, I, I got connected with him. He was a guest speaker at our class when uh, he was with the Phoenix Suns organization. And I stayed in touch with him uh, and, and an opportunity for their entry level sales role opened up. And I remember uh, reaching out to him and reaching out to a couple people that I had known because at the time I was at University of Arizona uh, and uh, went to U of A, uh, was a sports, it was a business management major. And so uh, stayed in touch with him, had, had an internship with University of Arizona Athletics. And from there, uh, um, was able to parlay an opportunity to interview with the um, with the sales team, with their sales leaders. And so I talked to their entry-level sales manager on the phone and then drove up on, I'll, I'll never forget, it was Wednesday, March 7th, 2012. I drove up from uh, Tucson to Phoenix, Arizona. Um, yeah, I remember waking up, at, it's about an hour and a half drive. My interview was at nine in the morning. I woke up, no joke, we'll never forget this, three in the morning, got dressed in a suit, Drove up to Tucson or from Tucson to Phoenix, and I remember meeting my uh, my eventual boss, uh, and he asked me how the drive up here was, and I remember saying like I I left at three in the morning, three four in the morning. He goes, well, why would you do that? I said, well, this is the day you got to have screw up time in there, like because I could get pulled over by a cop or I can get uh, my flat a flat tire. You got to have plenty of time in there, and I think like that was a good answer because he at some point was like. Hey, we'd love to hire you, which was awesome. But um, for me, that would, I interviewed with uh, with all the directors that day uh, for the opportunity to work on their team, and like that's just an opportunity, right? And so from there, um, fast forward to 2018 when I joined SBS. You know, if you do a great job at what you do and you really focus and love what you do day in and day out you don't need to seek out opportunities because opportunities ultimately will seek out you. And so I'd stayed in touch with Bob when he left and started his own business. And we, we I knew it was something I'd always enjoyed doing. Uh, and he, he approached me about joining his company back in 2007, at the end of 2017. Um, and I started in 2018. And at the time, I originally was like, I'm really happy at the Suns. They just grew me. I'm, 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 I'm tunnel was very tunnel visioned. But I kept thinking about it of what I love to do, and it was helping people succeed, working with a lot of organizations and groups to really help them grow their bottom lines or their careers. And then from there, um, knew it was a no-brainer. And so I started with him in, in 2018, and it really feels like yesterday. It's, it's crazy. It's been a little over three years, but a little long-winded answer for, for me. But um, for me, my interview process for this role that I'm in currently was, um, it was just staying in touch and really utilizing your network uh, in a genuine way. Uh, you're on these calls tonight. Kudos to you guys being on these, these, this conversation and, and, and connecting with us as panelists. Hopefully like you have our contact information after this and you stay in touch, create a genuine relationship because you never know where the opportunity finds you. Um, and don't just come out like a year from now and say, Hey, I need a job. I'm looking for a role, create a genuine relationship with us. And, uh, and, and, and opportunities will, will be there for you. That was a great response, Josh. And um, if, if anyone else, uh, Tomo, JJ, or Melissa would like to touch on that um, interview process as well. Yeah, um, I'll, feel free. I'll jump in really quick because I couldn't agree more that networking and personal relationships is critically important in anyone's career. And I think the story of 
Pygon and Nixon is very related to that. So I think throughout my career, I've always had and left companies in, in good spirits and good relationships and kept in touch with people. And even when I started my own company that I, I sold two years ago, um, my business partner in it was the CEO of a company that I worked for and him and I came back together and started a company together. And my role getting into Nixon was there's a lot of people that either worked for me in the past or people that worked at companies that I knew that it's just a network of people and they all heard my name before and they said, we know what you do and um, we think you're a good fit. And so I already had a leg up. And I think just having that open door of like, hey, this is someone that's top of your list you should talk to. Um, walking in, I, I already kind of had that edge of like, okay, I, I might be the right fit for you guys. Let's figure out this is a good fit for both sides. And for me, the, the culture fit and my background and experience with the brand and just all the stars aligned. But I think it all started with just that networking over, over the years, over the last 20 years of being in a, a good person that has good relationships with people that you work with and have exposure with. And I think every step in every part of my career is always tied to that networking side of things. So it's one reason why I'm part of this panel right now. I think networking with younger people, networking with other people in other industries is critically important to any anyone's career, even mine right now. Yeah, I can I can add something as well, Zach, there. Um, first of all, everything that's been said so far is spot on. I think that the networking aspect is big, but I, ultimately I think um, I do wanna give some advice as well for somebody who maybe doesn't have the network yet. And, and you know, if you do wanna interview for a job somewhere, I think, you know, part of the thing that I, you know, I went through was, it was a little bit of both for me. I, do, I did meet a guy that, that was in the golf industry and I wasn't looking for a job or anything. I just happened to play golf with him in a tournament. And he, um, I guess, was impressed with sort of my passion for the game and then my knowledge and just something about my personality. I'm not sure what it was, but he basically called me the following week saying, hey, you know, are you interested in working in golf? I mean, that's how I got my way in the door. And But I think past that, you know, as, as I got in, in, you know, involved in, in sort of interviewing and meeting other people at the company, you know, I was very upfront with saying, I don't know anything about this business. Like I, I'm not familiar with, with how golf companies operate. I've been working in finance and I worked in technology before I don't, you know, but I love golf and, and I know a lot about golf and this is what I want to do. And, and I think if you come across as, as authentic and you come across as being passionate about the industry and, and the company genuinely, um, that will go a long way as well. You know, I think if you combine that with, again, staying in touch with people and, and building a network, um, I think that's the kind of recipe to, to success. These are all great points being made. And uh, Melissa, would you like to add, add something as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just echoing what everyone said, I agree as well. The first 10 years of my career, every job I had gotten was because of a personal connection. Um, and Prana was the first time I did not know someone internally at the company. Um, so what was interesting about that process was um, I applied through Columbia Sportswear. So that's our parent company. Because um, I saw the job, I was constantly monitoring. And the, the the cool thing about Prana was the job matched exactly what I was looking for. It was exactly my skill set. Um, there was a couple of different things that I saw room for growth personally and professionally, which is why I wanted to take the opportunity. Um, so I went ahead and applied, um, didn't hear anything back for several weeks, and then I was contacted by a recruiter. So I had been speaking to a recruiting firm a couple months prior and, and for those of you that get contacted by recruiters on LinkedIn, I know it's a little bit of a hit or miss, but I'd encourage you to take the opportunity just to speak with them because um, I spoke to several people within their company, shared my resume, um, just kind of talked about what I was looking for. And again, I very niche wanted to work with affiliate. Um, that's kind of my bread and butter. So it took some time to find that. And so when they contacted me, the recruiting firm, I said, I already applied. They had never received my application. So, you know, it went into this black hole of Columbia's applications. Um, and then the process really kicked off. Um, Prana does take a long time to hire. I was able to get hired within three weeks, which again, was kind of rare. Um, they very rigorous interview process. Um, they are very concerned about cultural fit. It, it kind of comes across as this like North County casual brand because it's yoga and climbing, but it's a very high performance um, work environment. And so they want to make sure that their employees are going to fit that. So one thing um, that they used as an assessment is the predictive index, the PI. So I don't know if, you know, sometimes you have Myers-Briggs when you're interviewing, but they very rigorously consider that almost as much as my skill set. So I had to really make sure I knew how to speak to that, speak to my personality, my work ethic, 
my skills and how that was going to integrate with their team because that was really where the make or break was going to be. Um, so I just, again, if you come across that, um, encourage you to make sure you're very familiar with yourself and what you can bring to the table. And speaking about contacts and moving forward, you know, a bunch of my contacts I had previously at TaylorMade, I still work with those people. So there's huge agency worlds and there's so much inter uh, overlap. And so once I got into Prana, they're like, you know, a lot of people because I have a huge network. So, but it was just a matter of like communicating that throughout the interview process. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa, too. Um, all of those points made by all of our panelists are great advice that everyone listening can definitely make use of as they move forward in their professional careers. Um, my next question um, is, what, what are some key skills and knowledge that you need in order to succeed in your particular industries? And are there any areas within your organization where you've seen MBA students or um, you know, students who have uh, done higher education come in and succeed? Um, and I, don't, I could begin with that with Tomo. Sure, yeah. So and this is an interesting one because I, as I was sort of thinking back to kind of what, what got me my job essentially, um, I feel like it wasn't really a skill that was obvious at the beginning. I think it was more um, my thought process around golf and, and the game. Um, but I also think that you know, and it sounds cliche, but obviously that that you're passionate and, and you're and you and you're a hard worker. Like I think people um, sometimes think that it, you, you have a good resume or, or things like that will, will get you across the line. A lot of times it's people who seem hungry and they seem, uh, you know, humble and um, and willing to learn. I think Melissa made a good point about wanting to learn. And if you have a few pieces in there that that you can be open about that and say, hey, I, I love your company and, and I know this and this, but I also want to learn about this. And I think uh, companies look for people that are interested in learning and growing in their jobs. Um, for me personally, you know, obviously being uh, in the product side of things, one of the things that that was has been two things that have been really important for my um, from a purely kind of, kind of academic and, and, and skill set based things. Uh, I have a background as a mechanical engineer. And so a lot of what I do now is I work to put products together and, and come up with with concepts is I have to understand all the engineering behind it. I'm not the engineer that's going to do all the nuts and bolts behind the driver or the ferry wood, but I have to understand how things work. And, and having a master's degree in engineering definitely helps me do that. Um, and the other part is is design, uh, graphic design, industrial design. It's something that was a passion of mine since high school. And I, and I used to you know, it sounds <clears throat> silly, but I used to do all like the dance posters at college and stuff like that. And I used to volunteer for the for the yearbook to do cover design. Like I used to do all that kind of stuff because I love design. And so for me, this was a way to bring all my kind of passions and interests together and 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 really use those skills. Because I think one of the things that as you learn and you and you build in your career is you're going to build skills that that you love using. And if you have a job that doesn't allow you to use those skills, it's it's frustrating, you know? So if you can find a job that really taps into those skills. And I think, again, Melissa made that point of like, she found that job that had all those things in it that she loved to do and that she was good at doing. And I think if you can find that, that's really the key thing. And don't settle for just for a kind of a good title or whatever. It's gotta be, it's gotta fit the whole, the whole puzzle. And I think from an MBA standpoint, as you come out, you're gonna have a lot of good skills and a lot of good things that you're learning. Um, but ultimately it's got to fit the company that, that you want to work with and something from a company and a sports standpoint that interests you. So if you love playing golf, for example, go look for jobs in golf companies. I mean, that's, you're going to, they're going to get the most out of you if that's what you love. If you love baseball, not, you know, golf company may not be the best fit for you. I mean, it could obviously still work, but, but obviously following your passions is, is going to be a big thing. And it's going to, I think long-term lead to better success. Yeah, that's definitely great advice. Um, Melissa, would, would you like to touch on this as well? Yeah, I love what Toma just said um, about finding your fit. I think specifically at Prana, if I was looking at our e-commerce team, uh, a lot of us don't have MBAs. I've been able to work my way up without having one, not to say that you know, having that wouldn't be beneficial. Um, we do have someone on our team that's an analyst who just finished um, her MBA. And I think within specifically digital marketing and e-commerce and just that kind of realm, having that strong analytics background is really important. That's been an area where I've had to grow and, you know, understand how I'm running the business is all based on numbers. Um, so, I really leverage her and rely on her. So I'll kind of think through some different things because I'm the most familiar with my channels, right? I live and breathe those every single day and I have to figure out what I need and how to articulate that. So I'll go to her and we'll 
work really closely and she'll do digging on her side and I'll do digging on my side. And additionally, I work with my agencies because again, they really focus on those specific channels um, to understand business performance. So I'd say that's really important um, when you're looking for a role. Great, and, and JJ, would you like to touch on this, the skills and knowledge um, necessary to succeed in yeah, the industry as well? I, I think the passion thing, I, I fully agree with. And I think the, the subsection of that, which is probably what they're also hinting at is the industry you're in is, is really important, but also your day-to-day -day task. And I think um, when you find something that you like doing, you're gonna work a lot harder at it and it doesn't seem like work. If you do a job that's gonna pay a higher salary or have a title that is work that you just despise doing, you're going to be miserable in a couple of years. So I think it's a it's a subsection of it too, of the industry, the type of work, the type of company, but also the type of work you're doing is if you're passionate about it, you're always going to be learning. And I think especially in uh, my world of digital marketing, and I'm sure Melissa will agree with this, it's always changing. And so I think problem solving is a critical, critical thing of you're going to run into a situation tomorrow that you've never seen before. And you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable and solving a problem and no matter what role you are in the company so if you're at a more entry-level role in a company and you problem solve for your boss your boss is going to love you if you're a more senior role and you problem solve you're solving the business problems that are happening so um that's that's one side of the question i think the other part of your question was have i seen success with mba students and currently at Nixon, to be totally honest, I'm not sure how many MBA students there are, but I know in, in past in the agency world, um, I think what MBA students brought to, to any of the clients that we're working with on the agency side was that business perspective of, it's really easy to get caught up in the, the, the tactical tedious, like here's my job, here's what I'm supposed to be working on in tunnel vision. And having MBA students, they kind of take that, that level up of saying, what's the business reason why we're doing this? And is this the right thing for the business that we're working on? And having that context is really important because we're all doing things to be honest for the bottom line of a business or to help a business grow. So whether it's on the brand side or an agency side or whatever role it is, just having that mindset of we're trying to solve a business problem um, is critically important. Definitely. And um, finally, Josh, would you like to touch on this as well? Yeah, um, real quick, like, and it, to piggyback off what everyone said, like, find something that you enjoy doing. Like, uh, one of my uh, mentors used to always say, um, let your passions dictate your experiences. Don't let your experiences dictate your passions. Like, figure out what it is you enjoy doing and just go, like, don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the title and all that stuff. I feel like title, numbers, like, all that, all, like, will follow um, your attitude, your effort. Um, your care and passion, what you control ultimately will, um, will lead. And that'll be where, where you're able to develop your skill sets. Um, and that's, that's the intangibles and the things that you can control um, in any of our roles. That's, I'm sure that's, that's something like, as you can see, we all are passionate about what we do. And, you know, for you, for, for the aspiring people in the room that are looking to, to get into these, these industries, uh, you know, think like when you're, do your homework and, and, and research a little bit about those organizations or the person that you're going to be interviewing with, because I firmly believe that failure to prepare is really preparing to fail, like ultimately. So be prepared when you have these conversations um, and learn a little, like be curious and intellectually curious about wanting to learn about that organization and that person, uh, because you might be working with them, you might be working for them, and you could be creating a relationship long term. Um, so I think that's one thing. And then on the MBA side, you know, in the sales and business development world, a lot of times in the sports business, they want to see experience, um, over say just your degrees, which I think your degrees are very important. Obviously, like the more degrees in schooling you have, it's never going to hurt. It's always good. But when you have that MBA or you're going, you're in that program, if you want to bypass that entry level type of experience role in the sales world, you probably want to be in an a intern or externship during your time in that MBA program that um, that might have relationships with the, with the professional or collegiate program where you're maybe doing something in 
premium development or sponsorship or something that's going to be tangible that you then show have a have a um, lineage of experience so that when you're interviewing for the the role um, that might be a step or two higher than say someone coming out of undergrad it makes sense for you to be in that role rather than the person that's on an entry level team that has been grinding for eight to 12 months in a in a cold call 100 call a day appointment driven into the area why are you more qualified than that person and so if that makes sense um, that's what we look at, especially on the sports business sales wise. Yeah. And so, and so all of you guys mentioned, um, that, uh, the common denominator basically was, you know, gotta be passionate and love, love what you're doing and just continue that willingness to learn. Um, I, is there any, um, advice in particular that you, that you wish you had while you were pursuing work within the sports, um, slash life, lifestyle industry? Um, I can begin with Josh, I guess. Yeah, Zach, that's a that's a really good question uh, in terms of the advice that I wish I had. Like, there's two things. Uh, I actually was just talking to someone earlier about this today. One thing is is I think you got to enjoy the moment and enjoy the experience that you have with your peers. Like, I mean, right now, like I mean, I've been making the same joke. I feel the last couple of months, like the weeks are zooming by, literally and figuratively, as we're all on on these Zoom panels. But look have fun with it. it is what it is right now. Like we can be wondering why this is happening to us, or we can take this experience and make this better and us more efficient and stronger in the future um, as we come out from this. And so for us right now, or for, for, for you as a, uh, as an individual, like enjoy the moment, like connect with not only just the individuals that are looking to grow, like that you're looking to aspire to get to, or, or the, uh, the, the people that are currently in roles that you want, connect with your peers or people or students that are maybe a year behind you that are in some of your classes because you never know where those relationships eventually take you long term and look we've got more time on our hands right now probably because things like while our schedules might be a little more volatile because we're maybe working remote or it might be a little bit more um, uncertain where there's probably more time or more gaps in our day than we used to have and so I think coming out of this, we'll have more experiences in that world and we'll be able to balance that from that standpoint moving forward. And that's one thing. Two is like, you know, I, I, I'm a big proponent on doing your research and being in the area. And we talked about this as a moment ago that you're passionate about going into, like really, really figure out what it is you want to do and go all in in that world. Don't try to just like apply to a bunch of jobs and a bunch of different types of uh, areas of the sports industry or the leisure or wherever lifestyle industry focus in on areas that you want to really be successful in and you can gear your passions towards that um, and you'll find it'll be much more enjoyable in that process because you're going to have much more linear approach and, and, and similar similarities rather than trying to bop around and see what sticks if that makes sense. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, uh, JJ, would you like to touch on this as well? Yeah, I think it's um, when I when I think of the interview process, and this goes outside of the, the industry that we're talking about, but I think it's everyone needs to think of the interview as it goes both ways. And if you don't think of it that way, you're going to potentially end up in a spot that you're not happy with. And I, th another comment that was made earlier that's also related to this is you're a human, they're humans figure out what's a good fit between both sides. And so in the interview process, making sure that whatever their pain points, what they're looking to solve for to, to fill the role that you're interviewing for and what you bring to the table, it's a good, it's a good mix. And it's also a longer term plan for you. And it's not a, Hey, I'm going to band-aid a situation that they need to have cover for the next six months. And I don't know what I'm going to do after that. And I'm going to have to find a new job in six, six months or a year down the road. So that's the one main thing that I always would encourage anyone that I've talked to of like, it's, the interview goes both ways. Like, yes, you want to show up and you want to be re presentable and put your best foot forward, but you're also interviewing them. And um, thank you, JJ. Um, Melissa, w do you have any advice um, that you wish you had um, when pursuing your career um, in the sports and lifestyle industry? 
Yeah, I think echoing what Josh said, um, one of my mentors once told me your peer group, your cohort is going to be your strongest network for the rest of your career. Um, so get to know what they're doing, get to know what they're interested in. You know, a lot of um, my friends and acquaintances, I'm very familiar with what they're doing and where they're working. And um, they work across a variety of fields and it might not be directly related to what I'm doing, but I've managed to bridge and make a lot of connections. Same thing with professional networking. Um, prior to the pandemic, I was at a lot of conferences every year and, and building those relationships and bringing in partnerships outside of the golf space to TaylorMade. I did a partnership with hotels.com. Um, this past year at Prana, I did a big partnership with Capital One because of those relationships and, and who I knew. Um, I think in the larger context of, of looking at jobs and looking at opportunities, um, you know, when I came into TaylorMade, their digital marketing team was really small and there was this huge opportunity for growth. And that's something that I followed in my career path, like really getting into positions when they're very new and young and like starting those strategic planning processes and trying to figure out where we can identify room for growth. And that's where I really thrive. Um, so I had you know, great experience with TaylorMade and Adidas doing that. Um, and then looking at Prana, it was a little bit more of an established team um, and the scale of digital marketing and, and some of the other areas of the business was a little bit more built out. Um, but specifically, like there was tons of room for growth in the affiliate program. And I, I was able to tangibly understand their program from the interview process. And I got so excited because I knew exactly like how I could, you know, bring my experience. Of course, it takes time, but bring my experience to that company and really grow there. Um, so again, I agree with what everyone's saying, like make sure it's an opportunity where you're not going to be stagnant, where you're excited about it, where you're excited about the people, the people make the biggest difference in the world. Um, and make sure, you know, it's a stable business. Make sure you're going into like a good situation. I've had friends, you know, kind of take opportunities because they sound nice and they don't last long because again, they're not, they haven't fully vetted it or they're looking for a band-aid. Um, so that's kind of been my experience. Thank you, Melissa. That's great, great advice for everyone out there. Um, and then now finally, uh, Tomo. Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting one. I, I, I definitely um, can relate to what everyone said so far uh, to, to some extent. And I think for me, um, you know, I would say my biggest thing early on was not going into sports right away. Like I, I, I was always into sports as you know, growing up. And, and I think as I graduated from college, I got my degrees and everything. I sort of went into the mode of what jobs were everybody else getting, you know, all the big companies and the corporations and going into as an engineer, going into engineering jobs or accounting jobs. Like I was too much in that mindset and not really following my gut instinct of like, I don't want to be doing those jobs, but I felt kind of like, well, I'm just going to go through the motions. And so that was a little bit of a mistake. And I feel like I wasted a few years early on because I didn't kind of go into it right away. Um, and I would say the other one is um, sort of don't be afraid of taking risks in terms of job opportunities or, or things that that sound good. And you're maybe a little bit afraid of, well, that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. I feel like the, the times when I've I've learned and I've, I've kind of progressed and, and, and improved my uh, ability to contribute to the business has been times when I've kind of been out of my comfort zone and I, I've done things that maybe I didn't want to do and I did I, you know I felt kind of awkward doing it and and ultimately that sort of really led me down a path of new opportunities you know I think one you know one of the crazy things and I'll give you one example is early on in my career I hated public speaking presenting talking to to media like I that was like it, you know it was like there's that old Seinfeld joke about you know, the only thing that people, you know, are more afraid of than death is public speaking. It's like, I was like that guy, you know? And uh, so for me, you know, early on, I was, this was, but I realized like to progress in this job, you know, I, I, I've got to get comfortable, comfortable with this. So I actually sought out opportunities to do it, even though I didn't like doing it. Um, and it's so weird because now it's one of the biggest things I do in my job. It's like, whenever we launch a new product, I talk to 50, 60 different media people. I, I do training events. I, you know, I, that's like big part of my job, but you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I would never have guessed that that would have been something that I would now enjoy doing. And, and it was just because kind of face your fears a little bit to some extent. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Tomo. And uh, um, I guess that kind of wraps up all the questions that I had planned to ask the panelists. Um, I, I now would like to open it up to our audience to either, um, ask a question live or via the chat box. 
um, of our of our panelists. Um, I was actually curious. So I'm not an MBA, but I'm a master's in analytics student. So I was kind of wondering, like, how much do you guys know or uh, kind of are aware of like the process of getting like, you know, sort of an analytics job in sports? I can, I can, I can kind of start with that one. And if somebody else wants to chime in, um, for me, you know, one of the things that has grown tremendously within golf and, and I'm sure other sports as well is data analytics. It's a huge part of what we do now. And, and um, it sort of started with kind of with R and D, I would say, obviously data analytics in, in terms of like optimizing designs and things like that. But now it's obviously gone to the players, you know, and I'll give you an example. Rory McIlroy is one of our, our staff guys we actually work with him on his data analytics for his golf game. Like we talk to him, we, we have people on, on a data analytics team who actually look at his, all his data, all his shots, every single shot that he takes in a tournament. Mm -hmm. And we analyze his weaknesses and strengths and we, we can give, you know, provide that to him and in a way that's constructive to, to work with the right equipment, get the right equipment in his hands uh, and as well as his game with his coaching. And I think all companies now are looking for people who, who understand data analytics better. And I think for certainly for TaylorMade, we've, uh, we've expanded that team um, substantially over the last five years. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in to kind of piggyback off that. The digital agency world is all about analytics and data. And so we always had teams of people that would help with our clients. I think where uh, Nixon's sitting is definitely the road that we're going down of, hey, data for us, let's understand the customers, let's understand how people are interacting with our products, um, how people are interacting with the brand over time. Cool. Uh, so there's definitely a, a major push in, in building up of the team uh, on our side as well on the data and analytics. So it's definitely a good good spot to be in for sure. Thanks. Yeah, I, uh, on the team side, uh, those teams are continuing to grow uh, in terms of business and player and, 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 and operations analytics in, in a lot of different sectors. And so, especially coming out of the pandemic, like for the business analytics side, like in terms of we used to utilize on the ticket sales side, pricing modules, what things looked like in certain areas of the arena, what was our sell through rates. And we used business intelligence, customer relationship management. It was all through analytics. A lot of teams are starting to go in house with their analytics teams, or they there's companies that focus in from a third party perspective and there's a healthy mix of both. And so, um, you know, I, I, I encourage you to, you know, to, 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 to seek out people in those types of roles. Um, and network because like as a student right now like you've got you have time in the the cloak of saying hey all i'm asking for is just your brain to pick for a bit of time and if yeah. it starts as that you you're going to grow a relationship from there and you never know where it goes yeah it makes sense so i was curious like did you ever work on that team or had exposure to that team when you were working for the phoenix suns uh, great question. Uh, I, I, I would every week I had a, a weekly analytics meeting with our, uh, with our head of analytics and uh, our BI director, uh, business intelligence director. Um, for my team, it was focusing on what leads or what leads we should be calling or what um, certain team members, they were like, it was really cool. Like they plotted everything out and they'd say, hey, these two people are really great at these types of leads and they've converted them at a 65% rate, which that's way higher than it ever happens in sales is probably like a 20% rate. But, um, but it was, uh, but there, but they were always like, there was a reason behind it, which was really cool. And we were able to utilize it. Now the Suns were known as like, we're really, we're really attentive with business intelligence and very progressive. Some organizations aren't as, as progressive, but they're going to have to be like this, the way the world's going right now, like you just have to be a lot more efficient. Uh, and it all comes down to the, the analytics side, especially a lot of these teams that have had to unfortunately furlough and lay off in this pan during the pandemic, they might have to do a lot more, a heavier lift with a lot less bodies or a lot less minds. And, and, and the way to, to kind of curb that gap is in the analytics world a bit. Cool. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was curious about like how those numbers fit in oh, yeah. with what you were doing. You got to co you cohesively exist for sure. Yeah, cool. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I could touch on that too because I mean, as as someone who's focused on data analytics myself, um, I uh, I'm, and I'm also a diehard Chargers fan. 
I, I saw in the headlines last year that they hired um, a new director to head their um, analytics uh, analytics team. And um, I actually remember at the time looking up and I was, I was like, who is this guy? And I looked up on his LinkedIn and he was a master of analytics student um, um, a couple of years back. So he's a pretty young guy. Um, and it's definitely something that uh, a lot of the teams are hopping on in all the professional major sports, for sure. Nice. Um, Zach, I had a question as well. Um, oh, go ahead, Meredith. Uh, first, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this has been really interesting. Um, so Josh, you already started this conversation of what COVID has done a bit to, to um, your organization, but I was wondering um, from any or all of your perspectives, how everything um, from the last year has changed um, your area and um, how do you, what do you see um, your organization needs to grow and or change? I'm happy to jump on that one as well. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's been honestly insane, the, the golf industry over the last 12 months. We, um, you know, and it's such a great question because I'm sure all of us will have slightly different stories uh, other than the fact that we're all on Zoom calls all the time. That's the only, I would say, commonality potentially. But we, our business um, went from, you know, we're off to a great start January, February, March, April comes our business grinds to a halt. We sold zero golf equipment. <laughs> we had no sales at all in April. And most of May, we didn't sell anything either. So, um, and then uh, the weirdest thing happened. Golf became like the number one pastime for people who were locked in and had nothing else to do and they couldn't go play team sports. And so everybody flocked to golf courses. And, uh, and you know, the, the sort of kind of recoil effect that we were experiencing was was crazy because we had um luckily we didn't lay anybody off we we had kind of a long-term view on it and we said hey let's just hunker down and see what happens and uh but sure enough as golf came back i mean we turned everything back on and we for the second half of the year we were playing catch up for you know keeping stuff in stock in stores i mean it was it was crazy and so we had the strongest second half of a year in the golf industry since i've been in golf i mean it was like the biggest year ever um, and so our sport has been very fortunate to have had this opportunity of it's, it's been a nice outdoors thing to do for a lot of people. And we've, we're seeing a huge uptick in the game of golf, just people coming to the sport, just from all the research that we're seeing and rounds played and, and golfers who obviously new players, but also golfers who haven't played maybe in five or 10 years are coming back into the sport. So, uh, from sort of needs into the future, um, obviously we've, we've been optimistic for a few years that we've had a very strong growing business, but this has really sort of, uh, escalated that even further. And, you know, we're growing, we're, you know, we're predicting strong growth for, for 21 and, and beyond. And, and I think with that is going to, you know, come, we, we're going to have to staff up. We're going to have to get, you know, new people and, uh, and keep up with the demand. And, and it's putting a lot of stress on our business, frankly, because we can't travel to Asia and, and go to factories and, and things like that. So. Uh, a lot of new things happen. We're learning new ways to operate, but it's been it's been a roller coaster ride, that's for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Here's another question. Yeah, and I guess also on that on that point, um, something would be, you know, how how would you guys suggest that students, you know, try and leverage their their network and connections searching for jobs in this, you know, virtual world that we're currently living in? I don't know if anyone has any thought on that, but. I was going to say that's a fantastic question that I don't have an answer to, but I think <laughs> the, start, <laughs> the big part of this Zoom meeting is definitely a start. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of, uh, it, it's, it's a great question. I, I think um, utilizing one, like we're in this world now where we have everything at our fingertips from regards to social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, like, all the all the social media food groups right and so you know utilizing your, like your brand and what it is that you like want to accomplish and like seeking those those people out like you know everyone has linkedin these days everyone has some sort of social media be different than what and put yourself in a bucket like if you see a job or you see a, something that's open or you're curious about something like go out and like and, and, and create that opportunity in some way and, and network or try to find a way in, you know, if you see a job opening, 
there's probably going to be just assume like, especially in the sports and lifestyle world, you could have three to 500 people easily apply to that job. That's only for one to two people. So what are you doing to put yourself in a smaller bucket? Are you sending an email to that person? Are you calling them? Are you, if their phone numbers on LinkedIn, it's fair game. If their email is on LinkedIn, it's fair game. And all of a sudden you start, you send them a message. Does that put you in a bucket of then one of 15, one of 10, one of five, one of one. And so create, make yourself into a smaller pool because you're just looking to knock on the door to get the opportunity to talk to someone, right? Like that, then it's on you from when you do get that conversation of, of what you can do with that and take with it. But like, all you're looking for is a way in an opportunity. And actually, like what well, part of what our company is, we have a piece called the clubhouse, which is not the social app that's come out recently, but for us, it's a, uh, it's for aspiring professionals. Um, and so we have about 150 people in the industry, in the sports business world, all across the industry from uh, team sports agency, um, golf industry all over. Uh, and they focus in on creating, uh, we, we set up mentorship calls for aspiring professionals. If they're looking to connect with uh, people in the industry of over 150 people right now that they can set up a phone call with them um, and, and, and easily connect with, with these individuals. We've done over a thousand uh, mentorship calls as a, uh, as a platform since the pandemic started. It's grown about 300%. Which, uh, which has been really, really unique. We talked about what's it changed for our business. Like we're usually traveling to these different teams and organizations and partnering with them and going for a few days. And I did 43 trips in 2019. And you know, right now, like we've had to pivot to virtual. And you know, I think even coming out of this, there'll be a hybrid virtual in-person model. And, and, and that's how it's going to be operating. And so, you know, if you're aspiring to get into the industry, seek those opportunities out. And, you know, we also, if you want to talk about it further with me, um, you know, we're, we're always trying to help people navigate the industry. And so, you know, we have a, a crop of people that are there to actively give their time to, to want to connect with individuals. Yeah, that's awesome. I think for us um, in particular, kind of speaking to what Tomo said, we had such an increase of growth throughout the course of the year. Our business model really did have to change. Um, we are very prevalent in retail. So think about like Aria and backcountry and places like that. So with those closures, um, that traffic and those customers moved online. And then we were also acquiring a lot of new customers because we saw the increase in growth in activewear and loungewear. And we pivoted our business to, to meet those needs as well. But I think the one thing is, you know, we're going to continue to see the growth. Digital is now at the forefront of the company goals for next year. And so we're going to need, you know, the areas of the business to grow along with that. So I think um, thinking ahead of time too, you know, you might reach out to someone and there might not be a specific job opportunity at that company at this time, but think about it long-term. So I had someone reach out to me, a friend of a friend, um, just kind of ask me informational interview, what I do, where I come from, my experience, um, you know, ultimately at the end of it, she's interested in a design job, you know, down the road and we don't have anything at the time being, um, but, you know, now she knows me, we've made the connection. She came to the conversation with very thoughtful questions, um, very well prepared, very well spoken. Again, I can't speak to her graphic design experience. That's not my realm or my specialty, but on a personal level, I felt like we connected really well. Um, so I would be probably comfortable in the future recommending her. And that was really easy. It was a half an hour phone call. Um, I was more than happy to do that. Um, I find most of the time people are, as long as you have directed and pointed questions and, and there's kind of a goal to what you're looking for, but the goal doesn't always have to be a job. Um, so just keep that in mind too. And companies are continuing to flex and change and no one really knows we can plan as much as we want, but this whole year is based on not planning. So um, just have an open mind when you're going into that. Thank you so much, Melissa. And um, I see we have a question in the audience, uh, Morgan, I believe, um, you'd like to ask. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great words. Uh, I am an MBA candidate and former marketing and branding expert, but um, I am in interested in your company, but I can't find the intern job for your company in sight. Do you have a plan to hire intern job in summer? Um, and who was this question directed toward, um, may I ask Morgan? 
was there was this question directed toward um, one of the panelists in particular or um it doesn't matter yeah okay yeah if anyone would like to answer that I know Prana had an internship program in 2019 when I first started, um, and there were a couple M MBA or graduate student um, candidates. We didn't have an internship program this past summer. I don't know what the plans are currently for like moving forward. Um, I know TaylorMade also had some interns as well. Um, two of the summers I was there, we had interns, and then we got one specifically on our digital team that worked kind of across. At, when I left TaylorMade, there was three of us on digital, so he split his time um, amongst different members on digital and e-commerce, and he was actually hired into the company. Um, so again, I think it depends so much on companies' budgets um, and what that looks like and resources. I think now a lot of companies, we've you know gotten the hang of working online since it's been such a steep learning curve, um, but probably that's gonna, I would assume, take some time to integrate back into to workflows. But it never, it never hurts to ask. Um, companies and just to see where they're at. Thank you. Um, I'll jump in real quick if that's right. Thank you, Melissa. That is a great segue for me to be able to mention that um, TaylorMade has shared with me, the head of HR, that they are hoping to have internships again this summer. So we definitely, Rady students, we have our eye on that in the Career Management Center. So as soon as we um, know more about that, if TaylorMade can move forward, then we definitely will let you know because those are really exciting opportunities for our students. Thanks, Melissa. <clears throat> Thanks, Michelle. And um, would, is there any other questions um, from the audience out there that, that um, would like to be answered? Okay, well, um, thank, I would like to thank all the panelists for coming out this evening um, and being here in front of um, our students. Uh, there's definitely a lot of great advice um, on a lot of various topics that uh, hopefully we can all apply in our professional careers moving forward. Um, it was a wonderful evening and uh, hopefully once we get back in person, maybe we'll see uh, some familiar faces back on campus for some, um, some more panels in the future. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, we'd lo love to come to campus. Definitely, whenever it opens back up, call us again. <laughs> sure. Thank you definitely. so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone. It was Bye. wonderful. We appreciate you.